so today we are going to further investigate from the practical aspect uh, effects in the Earth's atmosphere. So today we are going to talk about precipitations and the effect of precipitations on radio waves. From the theoretical point of view, we have to examine what happens with the reflection from small particles. Uh, what we already did, we examined a sphere. A sphere with a certain radius. radius a. We had a wave coming to this sphere and we examining, examine scattering from this sphere. Uh, in particularly, what we were interested in, we were interested in the radar cross section of this sphere. What kind of, what, what is the magnitude of and phase of the reflection of a metal sphere? Uh, to begin with a metal sphere, we are going to talk about uh, the electric spheres. They are similar, there's uh, the electric correction factor in between and that's all what we have to do. It's not that difficult to come from metal to the electric. Uh, a sphere is perhaps the simplest geometry we can talk about. And uh, we should examine what happens uh, if we plot the radar cross section as a function of the sphere size. Sphere size, uh, radar cross sections say uh, to have the plot normalized to a certain size of the sphere divided by a squared. Since uh, for uh, large spheres, uh, we had this uh, example last time, for large spheres, so, so when A is much larger than lambda, we had uh, the label uh, radar cross section quite stable at sigma is uh, exactly the cross section of the sphere, the geometrical cross section of the sphere, P A squared. That's the geometrical cross section of a spherical object. Uh, this is, of course, uh, uh, independent, both uh, uh, independent, say, uh, frequency independent. Uh, or uh, what I could do here simply. I could just write, uh, uh, it is also uh, frequency dependent, it is also polarization dependent. And it's also direction independent. Uh, so this is a, a, a large sphere will scatter actually radiation in all possible directions as an omnidirectional radiator. So this is quite a good, uh, good example of an omnidirectional antenna, as we talked about. Uh, but the condition is that the sphere is much larger than lambda. Then we solve the problem by uh, depicting Fresnel zones, using Fresnel zones, because we know that uh, the derivations using Fresnel zones are polarization independent. Uh, uh, they, they are, it's quite similar. To, now, what is the missing part on this plot here? The missing part is here, what happens here when the radius of the sphere is approximately lambda, and when the radius of the sphere is much smaller than lambda. Uh, sigma over a squared, so we are normalized at, uh, at, this, uh, at this large sphere scattering. So the plot goes like this. At uh, 
the sphere approximately the direction of the wavelength, uh, we have uh, resonant effects. And this is also called Mie scattering. Mie was, uh, in spite of his name, he was a German mathematician. He was German, so it's not a Chinese. <laughs> Just to uh, say. Uh, Mie scattering is quite involved. We are not going to deal with it. But we are going to deal with uh, uh, reflections from spheres. Uh, uh, actually much smaller than, uh, uh, than the wavelength. And here, uh, uh, here an approximation for this curve, so uh, uh, the radar cross section is approximately proportion to lambda to the minus fourth power. And we call this Rayleigh scattering. We have really scattering down there. Yeah. Uh, we are interested mainly in this region and in this region. The resonant region is quite quite involved. So to to see what is going on here in the resonant in the BR region is quite quite complicated. So at least we should know large spheres and small spheres. What happened with with, with large spheres? We made the derivation two weeks ago. Uh, what happens actually with small spheres? A large sphere, spheres, what is this an example of large spheres, large scatterers? Uh, this is, uh, uh, say, an aircraft for centimeter wavelength radar. So for microwave radar, uh, an aircraft behaves as a large sphere. A radar does not, uh, uh, an aircraft does not behave as a large uh, as a large sphere for very long wavelength. If you have a VHF radar, if you have HF radar, then the, big, the wave, uh, aer aircraft behaves in a different way. And uh, if you have such different radars, then uh, those equations for last time are not valid. So we, we start an aircraft is a typical example for micro microwave radar, for centimeter wavelength radar. Uh, the, the, the dimension of an aircraft are meters, so they are 100 times larger than the centimeter <coughs> wavelength of the radio waves we are using. Uh, what is another example we have for frequency independent scattering from large spheres? Uh, we have this in clouds. <coughs> clouds consist of water drops. Not water vapor, but water drops, so liquid water in drops. Or ice crystals, say snowflakes, also making up a cloud. Of course, a cloud at 10 kilometers height at minus 50 degrees centigrade, it's only ice. It cannot be liquid water at 10 kilometers altitude. So um, uh, examples here are aircraft for centimeter radar. for uh, lambda in the 10 centimeter region and uh, uh, water drops in clouds at uh, the wavelength of visible light, so uh, land, uh, wavelength in the micrometer region. Uh, this is frequency independent. How do we know this frequency independent? Clouds usually appear white. So, if uh, the drops uh, of water or ice crystals are much larger than wavelength, the scattering is frequency independent, so white color. It's also polarization independent. There's nothing we can do with polarization for reflection of clouds. But there is something we can do in photography with polarization from other objects we have. So, what we have here in the Rayleigh scattering, why is this different? Di interesting for us, Rayleigh scattering? Really scattering is it? because uh, uh, gas molecules are perhaps less than a nanometer large. They are much smaller than a micrometer of wavelength. Gas molecules for visible light for lambda in the micrometer region. So uh, 
reflection from gas molecules follows the Rayleigh scattering law and it is frequency dependent. It becomes much larger at, uh, so uh, it is frequency dependent, we, we wrote it here, so. Uh, dependent. Uh, it grows with uh, frequency to the fourth power, so la lambda to the minus four is fre frequency to the fourth power. Uh, it is uh, polarization dependent. And dire direction also. We shall analyze uh, soon how this happens. Uh, what happens with gas molecules? Uh, something we could see today if the windows were not closed. The sky is blue. Why? What is actually what we see in the sky? The blue sky is Rayleigh scattering on uh, air molecules. Air molecules behave, uh, behave like small conductive spheres. And these small conductive spheres actually scatter shorter wavelengths much more than longer wavelengths. Uh, they are still much smaller than, than the wavelength. Um, a molecule of gas is less than one nanometer size. Well, probably uh, the, uh, the size of the atoms and molecules is around one angstrom. One angstrom is uh, 0.1 nanometer. So 10 to the minus 10 meters, that's the size of the molecules, just to uh, give you an impression. So for, uh, give you an example. So for uh, visible light, we, s we can actually see every day Rayleigh scattering on the blue sky. The sky is blue because blue light uh, scatters much more than green light and even much, much considerably more than red light, if the sky is clear. If the sky has haze, has clouds, then we have frequency independent Rayleigh scattering. Uh, frequency independent uh, scattering on large objects like water drops in, in clouds. But gas molecules uh, without any water drops, also water vapor, maybe water vapor, but no drops. No drops means the sky will turn blue. Not that the sky will turn blue, but this scattering is polarization dependent. So if you want to make a nice photograph of a landscape where you have clouds on the landscape and clear sky both on the same side, you can improve the contrast between clouds and, uh, clouds and uh, clear sky because clear sky is polarization dependent. So I can adjust the polariza uh, polarization of a polarizer in front of the objective of, of my uh, camera while uh, the reflection uh, of clouds is not sensitive to this. So I can improve or I can enhance the constant of const uh, contrast of clouds in front on a blue sky by using a polarization selective receiver like a camera with a polarizer on it. Photographers frequently do this, that's not, not that difficult to do it. You can buy such polarizers in any, any Photoshop, in any photographic shop. What is interesting for us here I said precipitations. So, water drops and even snowflakes snowflakes are uh, very small at lambda in the centimeter range. Water drops uh, the average water drop is a sphere with about uh, two milli one millimeter diameter. So a water drop is usually uh, uh, the diameter 2a is approximately one millimeter of a water drop. So water drops are much smaller. The same water drops that uh, are much larger than visible light wavelength, the same water drops for radio waves, they act as, uh, as very, very small scatterers. So uh, Rayleigh scattering applies, it is frequency dependent, it is uh, polarization dependent, it is direction dependent, and we have to see today, we have to go uh, into a little bit into more detail how to, how to handle this condition. So uh, uh, how to develop the uh, radar cross-section of a small scatterer like a water drop. 
Uh, a water drop may be a small scatterer, but usually we have many of these water drops in a cloud. So the reflection of, from a cloud is not that small. It can be detected easily. Especially if you have a heavy rain, rainfall or the most uh, important case if you have hail. Hail has very large water drops and uh, ice uh, crystals, very large ice crystals, so hail uh, has a very strong reflection on a radar. And we shall develop that today. So let's see what, how do we handle Rayleigh scattering. For Rayleigh scattering we have our conducting sphere. We will see what happens if this is not perfect metal. But uh, for Rayleigh scattering, this A is much smaller, considerably smaller than lambda. If uh, this Rayleigh scattering is considerably smaller than lambda, uh, then to solve uh, the field equations around the Maxwell equations around this sphere, we can use electrostatic formulas. It's not necessary to go to complicated radiation expressions. Electrostatic is quite, quite, quite OK today. And if we consider a metal sphere, at this condition, we, have, uh, uh, we can use electrostatic formulas. We can say that we want to have the potential on the surface of the sphere. So uh, R is equal to A, R is equal to A, we want to have the potential zero. Electrostatic potential because we are solving the problem using electrostatic means here. Because if something is much smaller than wavelength, the wavelength, we can use electrostatic formulas here to calculate our things. And we have a wave falling on this uh, sphere, a wave that has some electric field E0. What we could tell about E0, uh, E0, we can work with electrostatics. It's no problem because dimensions are small compared to the wavelength. We can forget the phase here. There is no phase shift involved. We can forget the phase. E0, we say that it has, for instance, the direction 1z uh, times E0. And we can also say that the potential at large distances from the sphere, R, is much larger than A. The potential at uh, large distances is simply uh, minus Z times E0. That's, that's what we get. It's linearly, it grows uh, the potential for uh, the case here linearly with the distance. If we have a homogeneous field, E0, and at large distances from our scatterer, the field is undisturbed. So we can safely assume that. And we are, all these are working with electrostatics. We have an electrostatic problem. Now, what is the solution uh, in, in electrostatics? What is the solution for, uh, for a metal sphere in an electrostatic field? Unfortunately, uh, we no longer have the course on electromagnetics. Usually in the third year on this school, say 15 years ago, we still had a course on electromagnetics. Maybe you, can, you did this at the fundamentals of electrical engineering in the first year. So uh, this is now four years ago. Four years ago when you handled electrostatics. Maybe you handled this problem in electrostatics. And in electrostatics what comes out here? Comes out that I can rewrite this uh, problem in this way. So Z is simply R times cosine of theta. If theta, uh, let's, let me write this here. So this is the already R. Here we have the angle theta. That also applies here, the angle theta. 
and this is z. Very simple combination. So to go to the same kind of coordinates, and of course if you have a sphere, we are going to use spherical coordinates. So if you include both conditions, the electrostatic solution you may have got three years ago. Uh, so for the potential as a function of r, theta and phi. Electrostatic potential, I repeat again. What does it look like? It looks like this. It's E0, our constant here, without the vector sign, because we know its direction, uh, multiplied by minus r plus uh, a to the cube divided by r squared cosine theta. This is what you may have got in the fundamentals of the electrical engineering. You can see that this solution, if we put r is equal to a, r is equal to a, this solution is exactly equal to zero. So we fulfill the condition of the, on the surface of the metal sphere. Further, on large distances, when r becomes large, this term vanishes and we have exactly the, sol uh, the requirement at large distances. So it solves both problems. How do we get uh, such a potential as written here? Uh, again, I recall uh, electrostatics. And in electrostatics, you had a point dipole. You had plus and minus q, so minus q here, the charge, another charge, plus q here, at a distance h. And what is the electrostatic potential generated by such a dipole? Uh, it's something like that. So the electrostatic potential, potential function r, theta, and phi. Of course, it's rotational symmetric, so there's no dependence on phi. But the solution is now q times h, so that's the strength of our dipole, uh, divided by 4p uh, epsilon 0, if this is free space, so it's the permittivity of free space. And then the coordinate, uh, the coordinate depends, dependence is cosine theta uh, divided by r squared. This is what you got at the fundamentals of electrical engineering. I say this uh, three years ago, three years and a half ago. You did this and you worked this out. And probably when you were students in the first, cla uh, first class here of study, uh, you asked, maybe you asked the professor, why are we doing these crazy things? So maybe today we are going to see what, 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 what was the purpose of that derivation three years ago. Because three years ago, this made no sense at all. Maybe today we, are see, we will see what we are doing here. And uh, what can we do now comparing these two formulas? Making a comparison between these two formulas. We see what is uh, now in one formula, what is in the other formula. We have uh, r squared in the denominator. We have cosine theta in the numerator. Only this term, because this term is incident field. While this term here is the di actually the dipole. And if we compare both both solutions, we see that, uh, uh, if we compare both, we see that uh, from this side is E0 times uh, A to the cube. And from the other side, this is Q times H, the strength of our dipole, uh, or the moment of our dipole, divided by 4P epsilon 0. So. From the incident field, incident wave, and from the size of our cube, size of our cube is radius of the cube to the third power here. 
This was the solution you got at the fundamentals of electrical engineering. We can derive the strength of our dipole. So the strength of our dipole is now Q times H, the strength of our hopefully point. Infinitesimally small, so uh, in a dipole we are trying to make H small and increase the Q to make this thing as small as possible. Q times H, we can derive it out. This is 4 pi epsilon 0 A cubed times E0. We can find the strength of the dipole. Uh, so we know uh, if we have a metal sphere, we can replace this metal sphere with an electrostatic dipole that's going to generate exactly the same field. So field zero on the surface of a metal sphere, uh, potential zero on the surface. This was maybe a little bit short, a little bit inaccurate, but I'm trying to make things simple for you. So, this is now our dipole. Our dipole in electrostatics does nothing. It only generates electric field, a static electric field that generates static potential. But we know what the dipole is. And dipoles are radiating. So this uh, small sphere, Rayleigh scattering, is just radiation of such dipoles. For the dipole, uh, in order to be radiated, we need current. And now where electrodynamics steps in. This was just an electrostatic type. But uh, 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 our uh, equations for electrodynamics say that we cannot have a static dipole, we cannot have static charges, but if we have charges, we also have currents. The current is equal to the derivative of charge over time, or this is j omega Q, written for harmonic quantities. This is electrodynamics. Electrodynamics is the continuity equation. So if char charge is vanishing, current must be flowing somewhere out of that electrode. If charge is increasing, current must be flowing inside an electrode. This is electrodynamics. Now, now we, we get, for, with this, uh, solving the static problem, we found the strength of our dipole. And now we are trying to find the electrodynamics. So the electrodynamics, what is now uh, we, in the formula for radiation, we need I times H. This is the, the radiation for the radiation of a small electric dipole. We need the current. This is just. Uh, uh, J omega uh, Q times H. So we can have the current. And now this current, what is generated? It is generating a scattered field. A scattered field that is equal, is scattered, is now 1 theta with the coordinates we have. Uh, J K Z over 4 pi i times h, uh, e to the minus jkr, phase, phase delay, divided by r, divided by the distance, sine theta. We have the scattered field. We can actually get from our incident field, we can get the scattered field here. Inserting all relevant quantities in our equation. And this is only radiation at the scattered field. We only looked at radiation. We didn't look at the near field as here. We need the near field, and we know that the near field is the strongest uh, close to the center of the sphere. So if the sphere is small, the near field is important on the surface. We can forget uh, radiated field on the surface of the sphere because the sphere is small. On the other hand, at large distances, this scattered field is what we are going to see with the radar. And where we are going to get also some, uh, 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 some useful uh, radiation. So uh, if we just plug this one in here, and maybe also this one in here, we can replace all this thing and get the scattered field. 
From the scattered field, we could uh, now make comparisons. We could uh, obtain the just plugging equations one into another. So this one in here, this one in here, this one in here, this one in here, just replugging. Uh, we have to calculate the power, the scattered power. So the scattered power will be what now? The scattered power will be just uh, one R the dimension. Uh, the, it's rad being radiated out. And here is our uh, E scattered absolute value squared divided by 2 Z0, where Z0, oh, sorry, I forgot Z0 here. Uh, the wave impedance of free space. So Z0 is square root of mu0 divided epsilon0. Just We can get the scattered field, uh, the scattered power, and from the scattered power we can obtain the radar cross-section. If we are interested uh, now just in the E scattered in the direction of our transmitter, in the direction of our transmitter, this scattered field is now at theta is equal to pi half. Theta is equal to pi half, so this sine theta is simply equal to, uh, to 1. But this is not true for all directions. It's not true for all directions. If I have to get a third time, I have to draw this picture. So if I have my metal sphere here, metallic sphere, I have an incident wave here. What happens with this incident wave? We have this radiation pattern, this sine theta, we have it here. And sine theta is also inside here with the vector sign. Sorry for getting away. So if we have an E0 falling here, E0, where is to go our scattered? Field, it's going to be very strong in the direction right back to the transmitter. Also, in the forward direction, it's quite strong. But this uh, dipole we have in here, the dipole we have in here, yes, it, uh, its radiation decays towards the z axis. This picture. So, the radiation pattern now of our sphere, if I depict it here, f of theta and phi is something like that, is sine of theta. So if I depict here the radiation pattern, this radiation pattern f of theta and phi is now equal to sine of theta. And this is where the scattered field now in the case of uh, Rayleigh scattering, the scattered field has a radiation pattern. There is no radiation here, so in this direction, uh, E scattered is equal to zero. And also in this direction, E scattered is equal to zero. Because the dipole does not radiate in, in x axis. There is no radiation of a dipole in its axis. But sideways, if I turn this thing around sideways, sine theta has no effect. If I look at this same uh, uh, problem sideways, so if I just flip the polarization of my transmitter, this is my raindrop. If I have now the incident field popping out of the uh, board, the wave still coming here with a different polarization. Now, uh, here, uh, sine theta is equal to 1. So now I have scattered field in all directions. All directions the same. So this is just a different cross section, a different cut of the same radiation pattern. So it's the same uh, sine of theta and phi. But in this picture up here, we were looking at the dependence of theta. We were changing theta. While here, uh, well, uh, phi was arbitrary. While down here, 
down here we have the same f of theta and phi, but now we are changing phi. We are turning our antenna in the phi axis, while theta is equal to pi over 2. So this is still sine theta, sine theta, but this sine theta is equal to 1 in this direction. So in the E plane, we have one radiation pattern in the one section. The other section in the H plane, we have another diagram. And this is the reason why Rayleigh scattering is polarization dependent. And also direction dependent, we have, we have a directional pattern here for this case. So uh, the Rayleigh scattering here uh, is polarization dependent. So we uh, transmit here, uh, we transmit here in the H plane, we transmit in all directions in the H plane, but in the E plane, we do not scatter in all directions. Here we scatter in all directions, not in the other conditions. So what does the photographer do with his camera, with his polarizer in the camera? He is trying to adjust the polarizer so that he gets no reflection from the blue sky and has a huge contrast, dark sky against bright clouds. And this is the trick uh, photographers do with their camera. <coughs> uh, now, what is the solution? For the, uh, for the radar cross section, I'm going to skip now the derivation because there are many formulas to put one in the other. So uh, a monostatic uh, radar cross section. Sigma, what is the sigma now in? condition of Rayleigh scattering. Okay, for the monostatic radar, we always have reflection back in the same direction. Uh, uh, in this direction here, in back in the same direction, uh, theta is always equal to P, o, P half. So uh, we always have maximum scattering, so we have no dependence here because it's a monostatic radar. Monostatic radar always back in the same direction. This sigma is now equal, if we go in mathem get it mathematically, is inversely pro 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 proportional to lambda to the fourth power, is proportional to the diameter of the sphere, 2a, to the sixth power. Why? Uh, you see it here. Our, the strength of our dipole is proportional to the a to the cube. And now this a to the cube goes in here and then it gets squared in the power. So it's, get, it's a to the sixth power. So it's a to the sixth power, and this two is just uh, a constant that comes in nicely. And we have the, all the other mathematical constants, constants concentrate to the p to the fifth power over here. So quite simple expression for a raindrop, uh, for a metal drop. Metal. Small. Next, we have to see how to handle uh, the electric spheres. We handle them in exactly in the same way as we did it here. So we ca I can just rewrite this equation here. Uh, also, the electric sphere can be handled with a point dipole, so small dipole in the center of the dielectric sphere, except for a dielectric factor. Except for the dielectric factor, and this is now, uh, this strength of the dipole for the dielectric sphere is now the same as we had before for P epsilon zero. Uh, A to the third power is zero, but times a dielectric factor, and this dielectric factor is relative permittivity of the sphere, an electric uh, sphere that has epsilon relative inside, epsilon zero outside, uh, minus one epsilon uh, relative plus two. Uh, also, this equation you may look strange here. You didn't do this in the first year 
Why you didn't do this in the first year? Because you only had partial differential equations in the second year at Mathematics 4. And you need partial differential equations to get this result, but it's not that difficult to remember this result. So I have this uh, dielectric factor is usually written as uh, upper uppercase k as uh, epsilon relative minus 1, epsilon relative plus 2. You can see that uh, if we go for a metal sphere, Uh, for a metal sphere, uh, this uh, k actually, uh, for a metal sphere, eps permittivity goes towards infinity for a metal. And if I plug in infinity here, I get that k is equal to 1. Where does this k play a role? It plays a role for the electric sphere. Uh, so the uh, I have a little, I'm a bit, a bit short with. For a dielectric sphere, now the uh, uh, radar cross section is now the same p to the fifth power here, lambda to the fourth. This follows out if we do all the derivation, but it, it will take us another hour just to do the derivation. Look at it around. Uh, diameter of the sphere to the sixth power, because cube gets squared, so it's 6 power, times absolute value of k squared. Uh, now, now we may look at the interesting quantities here. How does the radar cross-section change if the sphere is made of the dielectric, not of out of metal? We can look at water. And we can look after ice, at ice. Water has a very large permittivity uh, of around 80, at least for frequencies below 1 gigahertz. Above 1 gigahertz, things do change. So uh, here we are interested in this k squared is around uh, 0.93. So a water drop behaves almost exactly as... Uh, uh, a water drop behaves, behaves almost exactly as a metal sphere. There's a half a dB difference. Half a dB difference in, in the conditions of a weather radar is not even measurable. So we cannot even measure this thing. Uh, but for ice, for ice, the permittivity of ice is around 3.5. Uh, and this uh, K squared is equal to 0.21. So uh, this dielectric factor is much smaller for ice. But for water, is almost as we had metal. metal. For ice, uh, this is 5 times, this is 7 dB. 7 dB difference from ice. Uh, on the other hand, if we look at precipitations in the Earth atmosphere, water is really has a round shape. Water drops are mainly round. We are going to see next hour what water, water drops are really look like. They do not look like artists depict them. There's a difference. And we have to be very careful about that difference. There's a difference. We will see that they are not, if they are round, they are not the kind of the way artists draw them. Water drops are not tear drops. Are not tears. They do not have this shape. Uh, while ice, ice have snowflakes. Snowflakes have a much larger size for the same volume of uh, ice. <coughs> Even ice expands in volume, but the most important thing is that snowflakes have ice crystals, elongated ice crystals, and they have a much larger size. So A is much larger with snowflakes. And uh, actually what happens in the Earth atmosphere is that uh, when you are observing a precipitation on a radar, uh, you see both the top side of the cloud snowflakes, the bottom side of the cloud water drops, as it, everything is warming up when you go down, when this thing falls inside the cloud. But uh, the reflection from water and ice is almost the same, because water has a stronger reflection. Ice, 
flex are larger. And they almost compensate each other. So with the radar, we see both uh, snowflakes and water drops. And where do we get the highest return from the uh, weather radar? The highest return we get from a weather radar at the boundary when ice starts melting. Because at that time, uh, snowflakes are still large, but they already contain water with a much larger reflection of the electric. <coughs> so you get the strongest radar return exactly at the point where snowflakes start melting into ice. Mm. There, I think we have to make the break right now. <laughs>